Hello and welcome to the Doof Book Club, our monthly live stream discussion of a book chosen by you, our listeners. My name is Mr. Freeman, the greatest magician in the United States. And I am Scott Daly, and I'm a better magician than Matt Freeman. Wait, wait what, what? Pardon? No, nothing. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I hope you're having a wonderful Friday evening. Thank you, everyone, for making it. I'm sorry that we had to reschedule. Um, Matt is feeling all better now. Right, Matt? You're all. It's Everything's fine now here. Yeah. Old, How are old you? Old righty is all better. <laughs> old righty? What's, uh, what do we call our left eye now? The evil old, one? Old, old lefty. But... Is, the, is the right one uh, or the left one evil? Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't know, man. I think in this case, the right one is evil. We're both left-handed, so I think you and I both have a very different perspective on this whole sinister issue. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, okay, so we're here, and this is our book club. Thank you, everyone, for uh, showing up and and being patient with us as we had to wait. I think, uh, I think t- it was two weeks, two weeks late, right? I don't even uh, know. What is time anymore? Yeah, it seems it seems pretty pretty gosh darn late. Yeah, um, and we're sorry about that. But uh, if I can't read, then I can't host a book club. That is, um, they tell me a pretty key part of books. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, so uh, hey everyone, we're we're seeing a lot of names we recognize. We're seeing Vale, John, Tringard, uh, Miss Evil Doom, Ev. Um, if you are new here, if this is the first book club that you've attended, welcome. We are. Doof Media, and uh, we make podcasts about the stories we love, and we also host this monthly book club that usually happens on the last Friday of the month, but it did not this time. Uh, Matt, why don't you tell the new folks what a, what's a book club? Well, each month, Scott and I select five books from a pool submitted to us by our wonderful Doof community. We put up a poll for all the supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia, and then we let them all vote on which they'd like us to talk about. The book with the most votes wins, and then we all read it. That's right. And then we meet up on the last Friday of every month or two Fridays after that and chat about the book. We pull slides of interesting and important moments and dive deep into this book for a couple of hours. And for those of you that are in the chat right now, as many of you are already doing, feel free to talk, ask questions, make comments. You know, we we want this to be an interactive discussion. We want to hear from you as well. We don't want it to just be us talking, although we are the ones with the microphone. All right, Matt, it's time to tell everyone what this book is, although they already know because they should have read it. So what was this month's book? This month, the patrons picked Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell by Susanna Clark. The summary is as follows. (laughs) It is an alternative history set in 19th century England around the time of the Napoleonic Wars. Its premise is that magic once existed in England and has returned with two men, Gilbert Norrell and Jonathan Strange. There you go. Well, yeah, that's that's short. That's short. There's a much longer. So usually we read the summary from Goodreads, and the summary from Goodreads was like a page long this time. Yeah. I presume because the book is a thousand pages, and they just couldn't summarize it with any less summary. <laughs> um, True. Now we are going to attempt to spend two hours talking about this massive, massive book. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah, um, we have people in the chat already saying that uh, they're glad that we delayed the book club because they hadn't finished it by the deadline, which is understandable. Very understandable. Very understandable. This is a a lengthy tome. Um all right, let's so let's talk about what we thought of this thing. Matt, while um while you were telling everyone what you thought of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, we would like you folks in the chat to let us know what you thought. Some people are saying that they did not reread it for the book club, but they had read it before. Um what did you think about this book? What did, what would you think, everyone? And Matt, you too. What do you think? What do you think of this well, book? Well, I I fell in love with this book. Um I I think, you know, I usually like to get the negative stuff out of the way up front, especially when I love the book. And that the only negative thing I can say is that it did take me about a hundred pages to really fall for the book during which time I was like, Oh my God, this is going to be such a long and boring slog. And then once I was in, it was just delightful. And in fact, I was sad when I finished it because I was like, Oh, I, I want to just continue to live in this world. Um, which is a, a rare and special feeling when it comes to, to books, right? So yeah, that's that's me. I I really I really fell for it, and I had a fantastic time with it. And uh, yeah, uh, how about you, Scott? Yeah, I I I 
adore this book. Um, it's it's such an interesting specimen because it like does everything you would you would think a a first time like I, I believe this is Susanna Clark's first novel, and mm-hmm. up until a couple weeks ago, her only novel. She released her second book last month after I think like a hiatus of almost a decade, and it does like first book huge eight hundred pages. Um, it's it has very. Sp- particular and specific kind of prose style it is trying to tell the story in a very specific kind of way and and it is absolutely not for everyone but i I, this book charmed me Mm -hmm. it 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 just I, i just fell in love with everything that it was trying to do i mean it is it is very much a book trying to capture a a style of writing and a in a um a feeling of you know books from 200 years ago it's it's very dickensian in how it it lays out its plot and just kind of goes on random things and how characters like swoop into the story and then leave the story for a while and then come back suddenly and i don't know man i just like it it was not like i'm not saying it was a page turner and that like i was up late every night because i had to get to the next part but it was just a to, to for me I started it early because I knew it was long, and for me, it was just a very relaxed, slow, uh, you know, uh, an hour or so a, a night um, where I just sat and absorbed myself in this world for an hour, read however many pages I got, and then put it down, went to bed, and then I got to pick it up the next day and do the same thing, and I just enjoyed that experience. I just enjoyed just every part of that experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I I, uh, I agree with you that it's it's Dickensian. It, it 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 takes a lot of styles from you know old fashioned books, but I think it it's also definitely um, somehow still a modern book. And yeah, yeah. I hope that we get to explore what exactly that means as we talk today, because I don't know if I can quite put my finger on it, but I think it has a lot to do with like the psychology and the perspective of the of the book and and some of the characters in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, but like you know. Compared to the Dickens I've read, I found that it connected much better with me, um, and I think yeah. that's just because, like, uh, it, it's a, I don't know, it's a wonderful pastiche of of modern and and old sensibilities and perspectives. I and totally agree. There, there is, like, it is, it is in a way, and I don't want to say this meanly. It is in a way like it's it's a very clever and incisive critique on maybe not books of this time period, but on the people of this time period. Mm-hmm. Like, like it is, it is very modern in that regard. Like, I mean, the, the character of Stephen Black is like a, a fascinating character that just mm-hmm. like would not have been like the commentary around this character would not have existed had this book been written when it takes place. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, yes. Um, so some people in the chat are pointing things out. Like John mentions that it took her over 10, 10 years to write this book. Um, so that, that's, that's just so fascinating, right? Just to, to continue sort of plugging away at something like this for so long, you know, I, I, I believe that she released bits of it, um, as short stories over the years, but I, I, I wasn't able to really figure out how, like what exactly that looked like. Yeah. So that, that's kind of, um, yeah, that's what evil doom was saying as well, that she okay. did some short stories in the universe before publishing it. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it feels fully fleshed out. Like, I mean, and the, the, the <laughs> The footnotes are delightful, and the footnotes like prove that like oh everything I mention here has a story behind it, and I am confident in that because I'm going to put it in a three page long footnote explaining the story to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's really no there there's no there's no um there's no shame at at the pace right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> at at no point is is she like you know do you do you see through the prose or or or, or through the story like it like okay we we need to move things along. It's like she's she's always keeping exactly the very measured and deliberate pace that she wants the very yeah this very this very british just kind of just like and then this and then this and like Mm -hmm. even even when the stakes are ramped up and like it's at the end of the book and and i probably was reading a little bit faster and i do think the pace picks up a little bit at the end it's still like the way the writing is it's just like and then this happened and then the gentleman Mm -hmm. was there and then (laughs) Mm -hmm. um it's just i just i just found it delightful i really did yeah. I, I really did so so it's interesting i mean we're basically I, uh, seeing sort of two two classes of takes in the chat maybe you disagree with me but it's like uh, there's a lot of people who loved it thought it was a delight thought it was charming and then there's people who thought it was okay mm-hmm. um and i can actually see 
not being able to get through this book, you mm-hmm. know, like I can see that um, as much as I, I did love it. Like if, if the tone and the pacing just don't work for you, then you should probably give up actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. um, um, but, uh, but definitely worked on me. Uh, Daniel mentions the, the audiobook reader. And I, I am curious before we jump into the slides, which we should do here pretty soon, but I'm curious what the audiobook experience was like, because did, did would it just halt at footnotes and then jump down to the footnote and then mm-hmm. go through that thing and then jump back to the book. How, it, how did that work? Yeah. I mean, the footnote was basically, I think he would say the number and then he would read the footnote like where it occurred. Um, so uh, essentially it was like a parenthetical okay. where you would just sort of go off into this. Okay. And, and the thing was that that was not at all disruptive to me, like because of the, of the slowness and, and kind of atmospheric, giving everything it's due and it's space and it's time when he goes off on a, on a footnote tangent, you're just like, this is, this is fine. This is normal. Like, mm-hmm. like you, you get used to it really, really quickly, like immediately. So, okay. Yeah. That, that was one big thing I was curious about. So it's good to hear that. And you, you've got some people in chat agreeing with you on, on that, that regard. Um, mm-hmm. um, I, I think, you know, we're talking about like Tringard says they did not like Mr. Norrell very much. And, and I don't know, like, I don't know how much I liked any of, I mean, I liked the characters. I don't know how much I liked them as people. Like even strange is kind of a dick. Um, he's yeah. a different kind of dick than Norrell is, but he's kind of a oh, dick. I mean, Norrell, I, I feel is explicitly, a, a you know, an extremely flawed character. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think you're supposed to like him. Like the, the audiobook reader sort of does his voice as this like weaselly whining, <laughs> whinging tone, like, like a hundred percent of the time, even when he's not necessarily being an asshole in, in, in the moment. Um, that's just who he is. Um, and he eventually sort of, you know, has his turnaround by the end. Um, sure, sure. So kind of, I mean, that's the thing is I don't of. know how much uh, we're, we're jumping way ahead of ourselves, but the end of this book is Norl and strange stuck together for ever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, possibly. possibly. And I, I, there's, there's parts of that's delightful. That's delightful to me because like they are ironically, they are the ones that tolerate each other the most, each mm-hmm. other's eccentricities. Um, I mean like strange is such an interesting character. Maybe I'm jumping ahead big time but like he's just kind of a total dick to his wife for so much of the book and then he Mm -hmm. loses her and then he's like oh my wife and then he commits the rest of the book to trying to get her back um yeah i mean i i just saw it as he took her for granted completely yes and and that and that was the point and 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 it was only when he lost her that he realized that he'd taken her for granted um (laughs) so uh, did you see this from John? Clark released a hilarious review of her own book, but written as a conversation between Norrell and Strange. It's the sort of rubbish you'd expect from novelists. <laughs> I love it. I love that so much. I haven't heard that. She has such a good grasp on the vo- the distinct voice of every single one of her characters. I think mm-hmm. that's something that I found really remarkable. I mean, Strange and Norrell, yes, but everyone else as well. Uh, the gentleman the um each of the the women characters like um um god i'm blanking on their names why am i forgetting their names um what's lady pool um (laughs) this is bad of me i I read this two weeks ago yeah it's been it's been two whole weeks and and mrs strange it's because it's because they're never given their first names and and they just have their husband's names that's why you're forgetting them never i mean at some point yes but we we one one word in this <laughs> this massive book, yeah. Ninety five percent of the time, it's mm-hmm. it's Mrs. Strange. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. All right, so let's uh let's let's jump into it, shall we? Let's start. Sounds good. Let's start at the beginning. The beginning, as always, we start at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Chapter one, the library at Hertview, autumn eighteen o six through January eighteen o seven. Some years ago, there was in the city of York a society of magicians. They met upon the third Wednesday of every month and read each other long, dull papers upon the history of English magic. They were gentlemen magicians, which is to say that they had never harmed anyone by magic, nor ever done anyone the slightest good. In fact, to own the truth, not one of these magicians had ever cast the smallest spell, nor by magic caused one leaf to tremble upon a tree, made one mote of dust to alter its course, or changed a single hair upon anyone's head. But with this one minor reservation— they enjoyed a reputation as some of the wisest and most magical gentlemen in Yorkshire. 
The great magician has said of his profession and its practitioners, we uh, said that it's and, and that that its practitioners must pound and rack their brains to make the least learning go in, but quarreling always comes very naturally to them. One. And the York magicians had proved the truth of this for many number of years. In the autumn of 1806, they received an addition in a gentleman called John Segundus. At the first meeting that he attended, Mr. Segundus rose and addressed the society. He began by complimenting the gentlemen upon their distinguished history. He listed the many celebrated magicians and historians that had at one time or another belonged to the York Society. He hinted that it had been no small inducement to him in coming to York to know of the existence of such a society. Northern magicians, he reminded his audience, had always been better respected than southern ones. Mr. Segundus said that he had studied magic for many years and knew the histories of all the great magicians of long ago. He read the new publications upon the subject and had even made a modest contribution to their number, but recently he had begun to wonder why the great feats of magic that he read about remained on the pages of his books and were no longer seen in the street or written about in the newspapers. Mr. Segundus wished to know, he said, why modern magicians were unable to work the magic they wrote about. In short, he wished to know why there was no more magic done in England. Man, I'll tell you what, it has been two weeks since I've read this book, um, with the exception of the little bits and pieces I was reading today to, to pull these slides together and finish this off. And it's just delightful to revisit this this writing style again. Yeah. Like I just was sitting there listening to you and I was just like, this is just, it's just delightful. It yeah. really is. It's just right. charming. That, that's, yeah, that's, that's the best thing about the audiobook is you just sit there and let hours of this just wash over you. Mm -hmm. And what's funny is like a big part of like a, an earlier release version of Matt uh, would have said like, this is a terrible beginning <laughs> because, <laughs> because like, because it's so meandering. It's like, mm -hmm. what, what the hell is this book? Like we, like, like we haven't met the protagonist we have, like is John Segundus the protagonist? No, nope. we find out he's not. He's pretty irrelevant, actually. Um, but but actually, it's it's perfect because what it's doing is it's introducing you to the way that it's written, which mm -hmm. is this slow reeling out of information and some kind of like sentences that kind of repeat the same information in a slightly different way. Even um, the uh, it, it actually establishes like a lot of the important themes immediately, right? Mm -hmm. it, it does that. Um, and uh, and it has a footnote thrown in there because yeah. telling you, hey, there's going to be footnotes to establish that footnotes exist. Yeah. I mean, it is great because it is just so it's just so matter of fact in mm. its introduction of magic, which is just how the book treats everything. Like, it's just like, oh, yes, there's in, in Yorkshire, there's a society, society of English magicians and yeah. they yeah. study a lot and they're very studious and they're gentleman magicians, which means they cast no harmful spells on anyone. Um nor ever done anyone the lightest good. It's yeah. delightful. Um, yeah, so it's it's establishing all these things, and it's as as Sebastian's saying in chat right now, it's teaching you how you're going to be reading this book because you're just going to have a lot of these one-off things where you just kind of talk about this group of people, and they're they're going to be all very proper and gentlemanly. But the the narrator has like a very sharp wit at the way that she kind of insults them not mm -hmm. like not directly because it's it's you know it's very proper they're not gonna like directly call these people morons or, or idiots but just like just the, like the, that 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 bit right there nor ever done anyone anyone the lightest good is just a little barb just like a little mm -hmm. like these these they call themselves gentle ambitions because they would never harm anyone nor, nor would they help anyone. Um, yeah. And like, it's that kind of attitude that the narrator takes that I think really just is the thing that propels you through the story because right. it, she's telling a story and it, it's never outright mocking, but there's always an air of like, oh, aren't these people silly? Yeah. Um, and just in, in all of it. And I think that's delightful. I, I forget how explicit it is, but it, at least there's a strong implication that this book is like a history of English magic written by some subsequent person, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. 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 And, and so there's, there is, there's these little bits of editorializing thrown in there. Mm -hmm. Like you pointed out, the, the narrator voice is in fact kind of being snarky, uh, which, which really, really does make it way more delightful. Um, you know, mm -hmm. you could even say like th the way that certain stories are told or, or the things that are included versus excluded really tell you like what this book writer, you know, what this, fictional narrator wants this story to be mm -hmm. um, 
and it's great. Yeah, and I mean, it's it, one of the most hilarious, like, confusing things to the story, I think, to us in the 21st century reading it is like, wait a minute. So you know all about magic. You could cast magic if you wanted to, but you don't? <laughs> why <laughs> and that's yeah. like like i i love that like mr segundus asked that question in a very gentlemanly way but like it it just seems so absurd that like these are people that have devoted their like their their um job what their their profession is these gentlemen magicians mm-hmm. and they're not they're not even trying to do magic anymore they don't even they don't even try yeah um, I, I had this theory toward the beginning of the book, which I don't really think was borne out, but I thought that this was like an elaborate metaphor for like the industrial revolution sneaking up upon like <laughs> the, 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 the gentleman scientists. And yeah. I had this whole thing where I was like, I saw Strange and Norrell as like Edison and Tesla, um, which, you know, in retrospect, they were both in America and this is like the most English story in the world. Mm-hmm. So that doesn't really scan but but in 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 a certain sense i think maybe there's some elements of this here because like there's no it's more like it is like a magical revolution happens right Mm -hmm. there's no instead of an industrial revolution they have a magical revolution um so i don't think i'm 100 percent off base but i definitely was like over over uh applying my metaphor toward the beginning yeah i mean i don't know if that was intentional but you did tell me about that earlier last month and and i I love it because it does fit pretty perfectly. And like, especially when we get into the idea of like, um, like the, 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 pe- the world not understanding the use of it yet. Right. It's just like, like, look, I've, it, I've invented this thing and look how useful it can be. And they're like, what, what, what is that for? And then like you demonstrate its use and suddenly it's like, whoa, whoa. Okay. I get it now. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, Ev, Ev mentions like possible parallels between like Norrell and Newton and Strange and Leibniz, mm-hmm. which you know you could you could draw all sorts of parallels between like quarreling English gentlemen and, and their their pr- proper uh, you know so, sort of irrelevant conflicts and, mm-hmm. and silliness. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. John points out York- Yorkshire was the heart of the Industrial Revolution in England. Um, I, I think that I did read that like. Um, um, Clark did intend for like the uh, the north south divide of England is sort of a real thing. Like it is that there there is this real cultural divide between the north and the south, mm-hmm. and so she sort of that evolves and plays into the you know the the, the wild old magical part of England and the and the different. Yeah. Um, that, yeah. So that's definitely supposed to be there. Yeah. No, I, I think that's 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 the fun thing about it is she's created this alternate history for England, but it, it does in several ways tie into the, the real histories and the real things going on. I mean, like the Napoleonic Wars plays really good into this. So it's like mm-hmm. just like, OK, history, but also magic. <laughs> right. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. I, I like this world that she's created a whole lot. Me too. Uh, yeah, Michael, I think the Luddites do get, get specifically called out. I think there is a, a mention of Luddites later in the book, I believe. Yeah. Hey, let's uh let's let's see what happens to the learned society of York magicians when they cross a one Mr. Noyle Mr. Norrell, though. The learned society of York magicians was disbanded, and its members were obliged to give up magic, all except Mr. Segundus. And, though some of them were foolish, and not of all of them were entirely amiable, I do not think that they deserved such a fate. For what is a magician to do who, in accordance with a pernicious agreement, is not allowed to study magic? He idles about his house day after day, disturbs his niece, or wife, or daughter, at her needlework, and pesters the servants with questions about matters in which he never took an interest before, all for the sake of having someone to talk to, until the servants complain of him to their mistress. He picks up a book and begins to read, but he is not attending to which he reads, and he has gotten to page 22 before he discovers it is a novel, the sort of work which above all others he most despises, and he puts it down in disgust. He asks his niece, or wife, or daughter, ten times a day what o'clock it is, for he cannot believe the time can go so slowly, and he falls out with his pocket watch for the same reason. Mr. Honeyfoot, I am glad to say, fared a little better than the others. He, kind-hearted soul, had been very much affected by the story of the little girl, the little stone figure high up in the dimness, uh, 
the but by the story that the little stone figure high up in the dimness had related. It had carried the knowledge of the horror, horrid murder in its small stone heart for centuries. It remembered the dead girl with the ivy leaves in her hair when no one else did, and the canons and the archbishop and Mister Honeyfoot thought that its faithfulness ought to be rewarded. So he wrote to the dean and to the canons and to the archbishop, and he made himself very troublesome until these important personages agreed to allow Mister Honeyfoot to dig up the paving stones of the south transept. And when he was this was done, Mister Honeyfoot and the men he had employed uncovered some bones in a leaden coffin, just as the little stone figure had said they would. But then the dean said that he could not authorize the removal of the bones from the cathedral, which was what Mr. Honeyfoot wanted, on the evidence of the little stone figure. There was no precedence for such a thing. Ah, said Mr. Honeyfoot, but there was, you know. And the argument raged for a number of years, and as a consequence, Mr. Honey Honeyfoot really had no leisure to repent signing Mr. Norrell's document. <laughs> so, okay. Uh... There's a couple reasons I wanted to pull this. First of all, what happens to the learned society of York magicians is like the perfect way of defining who Mr. Norrell is as a character, right? He's this, the, the, at the time of this book, the only practicing magician in all of England. And he has made it his express purpose that he wants to bring magic back to the continent, right? Or to the, to the Island. And the first thing he does is cast a spell and then banish everyone in Yorkshire from, ever practicing magic or studying magic mm -hmm. or doing anything with magic ever again. And it's this hilarious contradiction at the core of, of Mr. Norrell's character because he wants everyone to love and respect magic, but only if it comes from him mm -hmm. and nowhere else. And, and I, I, that's a hilarious contradiction and it's, it's one of the things that I love about him as a character so much. Yeah. The, the book really slow plays the reveal that he has been, you know, assiduously collecting all of the magical books in the whole world so that nobody else can have them. Um, and I just love, I love, like, it takes you a while to realize, like, what what he actually is as a character because he, he goes, like, way out of his way to make sure that he can't possibly have any competitors, right? Yeah. And so that that's why when Strange comes along, like, Strange is basically this prodigy. Um, it, it's, 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 it's such a, you know, such a bee in his bonnet. Yeah, um, yeah. The other thing about this page that you read is like it really does have like a run on sentence quality because almost like so many of the uh, sentences actually begin with so or and, mm -hmm. which uh, and, and but, um, all of which are words you're not supposed to begin a sentence with because they oh, basically yes. just make it so that you read it on and on and on and on and like as if it's the same sentence. Yes, so it's a I remember. Great example. I remember my English teacher yelling at me for for doing those things. Yeah, and I would be like, "But I read a book, yeah. just yesterday, and they did that." Right. And she'd be like, "Well, just because they did it doesn't mean it was but, correct." But the reason she is breaking the rule here is because she wants to create this impression that this is all to be read in one breath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, um, which was actually pretty hard to do when I was trying to go yeah. back over and read it. I mean, the other the other thing that I wanted to point out here is just the inherent privilege with which the like all of our characters operate. Like, you know, there, there's talks throughout this book of. Um, a lot of these characters and like, Oh, he, he must, he must marry the, the lady pool because then he'll be destitute and bankrupt. And it's like, but like, not really though, but just like, just like destitute and bankrupt for a proper English gentleman, not like, mm -hmm. not like real poor. And mm -hmm. like, these are people the the learned society of York magicians are people who they are intellectuals, but they are intellectuals in a specific trade that they are banned from. And what do they do? What do they spend the rest of their life doing? Well, nothing <laughs> yeah, because right. they're rich they're the, the rich aristocracies of yeah. of this world and so there's there's nothing and it's just so, like there there is a there is a serious divide between the characters in this book that serve as the servants serve as the working class serve as the help and the characters you know including our two titular ones that are lords that are the the powerful and the rich and and it is fascinating the ways in which, again, the tone of this book kind of is taking little pot shots at, the, mm -hmm. at that kind of stuff. Like, like the, yeah. this whole first paragraph here is like the, 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 the words behind the words are like, isn't it like ridiculous? What, what, does, what does a man in this world do when he cannot study magic anymore? Well, he does nothing. Yeah. He just becomes useless. Yes. Which, in fact, just reveals that he was useless the whole time. This was just Indeed. his hobby. Yep. Um, and, I mean, that's that's what's interesting is basically it's 
when we finally do get to, to to strange in particular it's like he's he's just this perfect dilettante where there's like he he thinks about maybe i'll be a farmer or maybe i'll be a sculptor or maybe like <laughs> yeah he, like like he, he's this it's fascinating because he's an interesting character because like the book is clear that he's just like one of those unique frustrating individuals who is going to be great at anything he tries yep but he can't focus on anything mm-hmm. and then he suddenly kind of becomes obsessed with magic and he's going to and of course he's going to be great at magic but like he's he's actually you know he's he's you know the privileged landed gentry just like mm-hmm. all these people where yeah. Yeah. they're getting their their income from the land and uh they don't have to do anything obviously yeah i mean isn't it true that the only reason he goes into magic too is because the one guy comes up and tells him he's going to be mm-hmm. a magician like you're yeah. you're a magician and he right. goes am i interesting yeah. it's not magic, anything that he eh? chooses. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. great <laughs> he the, just like yeah. decides so so the other funny the other funny thing which i think we kind of we kind of skipped over so i think this is a fine time to talk about it mm-hmm. um or, no maybe we didn't yet but anyway it doesn't matter the point is um it was it's like immediately obvious from the moment children mass enters the story that children mass is a magician yeah the book takes like 870 pages to admit (laughs) that children mass is a magician um because like i think that's part of the like north south divide where like the kind of magician he is is not a gentlemanly magician and so we're not going to talk about him in our history of english magic you know yeah yeah Um, yeah totally um it's it's really fascinating because I told like I saw that coming too like and I mean when we didn't talk about it when like it's because Segundus and and Childerness like have an entire conversation where he's like yes do you think the London Post will hear like the reason why Norrell is discovered is because of his servant right because of like Childerness's tenaciousness and and drive to actually succeed um yeah Childerness does more for actually making English magic come back than anyone. People in chat are saying they thought that he was secretly the Raven King. I thought he was secretly the Raven King. I, ha- I actually I actually think that Clark wanted us to think that he was the Raven King. I yeah. thought that, that like like I think that was an intentional misdirect. Like uh, actually for a while I thought he was just a fae. I thought he was a fairy uh, a fairy servant who was sort of pushing Norrell to do these things. And it took me a while to even accept that no he's just he's just a man. Um <laughs> but he has his own motivations and, and the book is really, really slow with playing like, okay, who is children mass really? Cause he's just so mysterious for yeah. so long. You assume something big is going on there. It, it kind of makes you uh, to, to your point about how this is even, even as it's poking fun at these people, this is still from the perspective of like, uh, obviously a gentlemanly class telling this, this history. It, it, it the book is never going to focus on children, children mass because he, he's not, a gentleman so mm-hmm. it, it kind of forces you to read between the lines and i think one of the remarkable things that clark does is she fills those in between the lines in between like like she cleverly constructs this book and i understand why it took her 10 years to do it in which all the stuff is there in between everything but you have to look for it mm-hmm. yeah i love children mass so much i do too he's wonderful children mass and uh and steven were my absolute favorite characters yeah, they're just both too. wonderful yeah uh do all we want right, to move so, on yeah. yep Next slide. Um, so this is just a, a, a fun interlude of characters talking about how magic is not respectable. Mr. Norrell, said Sir Walter, I cannot claim to understand what this help is that you offer us. Oh, as to particulars, Mr. Norrell said, I know as little of warfare as the generals and the admirals do of magic, and yet... But whatever it is, continued Sir Walter, I am sorry to say that it will not do. Magic is not respectable, sir. It is not. Sir Walter searched for a word. Serious. The government cannot meddle with such things. Even this innocent little chat that you and I have had today is likely to cause us a little embarrassment when people get to hear of it. Frankly, Mr. Norrell, had I understood better what you were intending to propose today, I would not have agreed to meet you. Sir Walter's manner, as he said it, as he said all this, was far from unkind, but, oh, poor Mr. Norrell, to be told that magic was not serious was a very heavy blow. To find himself classed with the dream bitches and the vinculuses of the world was a crushing world, a crushing, crushing one. In, in vain he protested that he had thought long and hard about how to make magic respected once more. In vain he offered to shew Sir Walter a long list of recommendations concerning the regulation of magic in England. Sir Walter did not wish to see them. He shook his head and smiled, but all he said was, 
I'm afraid, Mr. Norrell, that I can do nothing for you. When Mr. Drawlight arrived at Hanover Square that evening, he was obliged to listen to Mr. Norrell lamenting the failure of all his hopes in succeeding with, of succeeding with, with Sir Walter Pole. Well, sir, what did I tell you? cried Drawlight. But oh, poor Mr. Norrell, how unkind they were to you. I am very sorry for it, but I am not the least surprised. I have always heard that those winter towns were stuffed full of pride. Um... <laughs> I, I did love the whole interlude. Like I just, God, I love everything about this. Uh-huh. I love how I love how English it is that they don't have any interest in using magic, even though it's like, well, okay. So like the first thing is like the book takes so long to even show you like what magic is, right? <laughs> like like we get the teaser, which is what he does to the church, right? Mm-hmm. But then we see no more magic for hundreds of pages, and you're just like, when are we gonna get to the fireworks factory with the magic? <laughs> um, it takes so long for any more ma- I think the next magic that happens after that is resurrecting Lady Pole, right? Yes. Um, yes. But uh, yeah, it's just it's it's it really keeps you wanting it, and and so like you can almost you can almost sympathize with these Englishmen being like I'm I don't I don't see the point because like Norrell isn't actually like Norrell seems to have no understanding of how to make the magic actually seem like something desirable. Yeah, because like, he's he's terrible at it. Like, yeah, and yeah. The, I mean the the wonderful thing about this world is, as we learn further, magic can basically do anything. Uh, yeah, like seems like it. This is a very loose magic system, um, the, and and they basically become incredibly powerful. Like, just like the at one point they're just like putting spells up to protect like the entire island from erosion from the waves like just uh-huh. just, just that's just a thing that they do and then of right. course you have strange's adventures during the war where he just builds roads disappearing roads yeah. which is like moves the cities. most important yeah he moves cities he builds like the most important strategic advantage of moving troops around and he just like can casually do it it's like oh why didn't you say so before it's just like the the uses for this stuff are endless but no one takes it seriously and i mean one of the things that um one of the things that i i think this really works for me because the book does not really explain to you the the grand history of magic in england until in in bits and and pieces throughout the book right and so it's not really until you're about halfway through the book that you kind of really grow to understand that um it's this grand wonderful tradition that that the raven king is like partially the king of england um and like magic has this wonderful tradition so like i when i was reading this stuff i'm i'm in sir walter's perspective as a guy like i'm trying to say like what would what would i do if someone came up to me and said oh yes i can i can help you with with your military with with magic i'd just be like what the fuck are you talking about like you're Mm -hmm. you're a joke like yeah. it just but then you learn later that no like like it, all the histories talk about magic and it has this grand tradition and it's yeah. just like no but it's not proper anymore it's not yeah. like it's not it's it's not serious as yeah. he says it's it's become associated with the the dream ditches and the vinculuses mm-hmm. as he says yeah yeah and and there is a kind of like a hilarious lack of imagination that we're we're like finally when strange is finally in the french theater it, like He'll he'll have like no no one or at least it takes a really long time for uh, for Lord Wellington to be like hey can you can you do this because um, at, at first at first it's just like completely underappreciating the presence of like this massively powerful asset that they have mm-hmm. um, yeah yeah it's, it's funny yeah and I mean it seems like like I I remember the parts where Napoleon is like desperately searching for magicians of his own but he can't find any because. <laughs> the french (laughs) this is english magic yes yes Um, i i kind of want to talk about um i want to i want to talk about draw light but i think we'll have opportunity to talk about draw light on a later slide sure sure yeah we'll come back to him um so do we want to meet the gentleman with the thistle down here let's do it you will not help me he said you will not bring the young woman back from the dead I did not say so, said the gentleman with the thistle-down hair, in a tone which suggested that he wondered why Mr. Noyle should think that. I must confess, he continued, that in recent centuries I have grown somewhat bored of the society of my family and servants. My sisters and cousins have many virtues to recommend them, but they are not without faults. They are, I am sorry to say, somewhat boastful, conceited, and proud. This young woman, he indicated, Miss Wintertown, she did. She has, I dare say, all the usual accomplishments and virtues. She was graceful, witty, 
Vivacious, capricious, danced like sunlight, rode like the wind, sang like an angel, embroidered like Penelope, spoke French, Italian, German, Breton, Welsh, and many other languages? Mr. Norrell said he supposed so. He believed that those were the sorts of things young ladies did nowadays. Then she will be a charming companion for me, declared the gentleman with thistle-down hair, clasping his hands together. Mr. Norrell licked his lips nervously. What exactly are you proposing? Grant me half the lady's life, and the deal is done. Half her life? echoed Mr. Norrell. Half, said the gentleman with the thistle-down hair. But what would her friends say if they learnt I had bargained away half her life? asked Mr. Norrell. Oh, they would never know anything of it. You may rely on me for that, said the gentleman. Besides, she has no life now. Half a life is better than none. Half a life did indeed seem a great deal better than none. With half a life, Miss Wintertown might marry Sir Walter and save him from bankruptcy. Then Sir Walter might continue in office and lend his support to all Mr. Norrell's plans for reviving English magic. But Mr. Norrell had read a great many books in which were described the dealings of the other English magicians with persons of this race, and he knew very well how deceitful they could be. He thought he saw how the gentleman intended to trick him. But he, he didn't. He, it, it didn't, he, actually. He, he didn't. <laughs> and, then, and then he completely failed to follow up in any way. Yeah. Um, uh, so first of all, the gentleman with the thistle down hair is one of the most delightful villains I've ever had the, the pleasure of reading about he's ever. So good. He he's is. so good. He's so good because you love him and he's terrifying. Mm-hmm. He's he's like the, the the way he's described is so great because it's like he's. He's so like flighty and insane, but yeah. like arbitrarily powerful. It's like an even more insane version of Q. <laughs> yeah. where just like at any moment, he could just, just do anything. Just kill everyone. Just, yeah. yeah. Like, and, yeah. and Steven is just like managing him for decades. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it's, you're so exhausted for poor Steven. Mm hmm. He, yeah. He, he, earn, he earns it. He earns it. Yeah. But there, there, there's so much delightful stuff here. Obviously, like, I don't know about you, but I, I saw. I saw the trap here immediately, like uh, just um, what he was going to actually do. Um, I, I, I didn't I didn't guess exactly what he does, but I was like, well, surely this is not a good deal, actually. And, and you know, Norrell shouldn't go in for it. The other great thing about this, of course, is that Norrell's like public position is just like so stridently. You know, you should never have anything to do with fairies. Fairies are the worst. It's a terrible idea. And like like one of the one of the first and most important pieces of magic that he does is just summoning a fairy and asking the fairy to do it for him yeah and not actually do anything just asking yeah. the fairy to do it yeah yeah, yeah. And, and it is like the the fairy the first deal the fairy offers is just give me credit for this right mm-hmm. like just let me take credit for this magic i'm doing mm-hmm. and norrell's like no <laughs> i can't yeah. do that and and like look here like when when he says, give me half her life, like he, he, uh, taking away half this woman's life. Yeah, she's dead already. But wh- his first response is, but what would her friends say if they learnt I had bargained away half her life? Right. Not like, but what would her friends say if she was gone suddenly? Right. For, and like, it's it's how would that affect me? And, yeah. and even like none none of this has anything to do with lady pool her pole herself like half a life did indeed seem great a great deal better than none with half a life miss wintertown might marry sir walter and save him from bankruptcy that's about him that's not about her then sir walter might continue in office and support miss norrell's plans immediately back to about him yeah. this is like no concern for the dead woman at all um yeah. it, it's just it's just it's hilarious and all the things that that the gentleman with the thistle down hair is saying about um miss wintertown is not true <laughs> right mm-hmm. like she was sickly um for a very long time because her mother like refused to go to a doctor for her so mm-hmm. like danced like the sunlight rode like the wind mm, mm, not this girl that that was not that was not who she was really mm-hmm. although when he brings her back interestingly she is like supernaturally vivacious for for a short period of time mm-hmm. Before he starts taking her at night and then she becomes listless. So. Yeah. I mean, it's almost as if like the magic he used to bring her back, like instilled the exact qualities he wanted in her because she has mm-hmm. no agency in any of this, the stuff that's happening in, in yeah. any of this. Yep. It's, uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> People are talking about how Norrell is not good about caring about anyone. And Sebastian says, particularly women. Yeah. He doesn't care about women at all, at all. Yeah. Uh, he has right. no, he has no time for them. Uh, he is, yeah. he was, 
incredibly against them learning magic ever. Right, which is which is especially bad because the book is clear that there were there were great uh, women magicians in the past. Yeah, of course there so were. Yeah, this is just his own personal dickishness. Yeah, and it's again contradictory to his stated goal, which is to bring magic back and make magic more serious and and respectable and and uh, prevalent in England. You're you're ruling out half the population um, mm. because because he's a dick. He's a dick. Yes. Oh, Mister Norrell. The yeah. funny thing about it is, like, yeah, he clearly doesn't like women, but he he doesn't like them in the kind of way where he just, like, doesn't know what to do with them. And it, it's almost funny at times when he's talking to women. He's just like, oh, I, yes, yeah. whatever. Like, he just right. doesn't know how to talk to women either at yeah. all. Well, he's just so bad at everything. Yes. That it's it's yes. just it, like, like it goes. It, uh, it's a careful balancing act because I don't actually hate Norrell. He's just he's terrible, but he's ter- so terrible that it's funny. And that makes it way more readable than if he was hateable, mm-hmm. right? Like, like him going to dinner parties and being like completely impossible to, t- to talk to, but draw light like, keeps sending him to more and more dinner parties and mm-hmm. he keeps just being terrible at being a dinner party guest. It's like, it's hilarious. It's like, it's it farce, is. right? Yeah. Yeah. It's great. It is great. There is, there is a part of you that can't stand him, but I do think like Clark keeps him between like just shitty and, and also like, like we make fun of him yeah, that that sort like of pitiful yeah yeah pitiful is the right word yeah so like i i never like outright hated him I, I didn't like him i didn't think he was a good person but i never like i could never just say oh i fucking hate this guy yeah um and i think that's a good a good line to walk with a character like this it, it is amazing how much of the book we're just with norrell mm-hmm. um, yeah considering how unlikable he is um, but i still enjoyed that part of the book yes i did too shall we move on yes let's do so the next is, uh, I guess this is a bit of Stephen Black and the gentleman's first meeting. Mm-hmm. Together, he and Stephen admired his reflection in the mirror. Stephen could not help but notice how they perfectly complemented each other, gleaming black skin next to opalescent white skin, each a perfect example of a particular type of masculine beauty. Exactly the same thought seemed to strike the gentleman. How handsome we are, he said in a wondering tone. But I see now that I have made a horrible blunder. I took you for a servant in this house, but that is quite impossible. Your dignity and handsomeness proclaim you to be of noble, perhaps kingly birth. You are a visitor here, I suppose, as I am. I must beg your pardon for imposing upon you, and thank you for the great service you have done me in making me ready to meet the beautiful Lady Pole. Stephen smiled. No, sir. I am a servant. I am Sir Walter's servant. The gentleman with the thistle-down hair raised his eyebrow in astonishment. A man as talented and handsome as yourself ought not be a servant, he said in a shocked tone. He ought to be the ruler of a vast estate. What is beauty for, I should like to know, if not to stand as a visible sign of one's superiority to everyone else? (laughs) But I see how it is. Your enemies have conspired together to deprive you of all your possessions and to cast you down among the ignorant and lowly. No, sir, you are mistaken. I have always been a servant. Well, I do not understand it, declared the gentleman with the thistle-down hair, with a puzzled shake of his head. There is some mystery here, and I shall certainly look into it just as soon as I am at liberty. But, in the meantime, as a reward for dressing my hair so well, and all the other services you have done me, you shall attend my ball tonight. This was such a very extraordinary proposal that for a moment Stephen did not know quite what to say. Either he is mad, he thought, or else is some sort of radical politician who wishes to destroy all distinctions of rank. Oh man, I love this. Um, I, I wanted to use this slide to kind of just talk about Stephen and the gentleman. Um, yeah. Throughout the story, yeah. because it's such an important part of the story. And I think this first meeting really defines this. I mean, the gentleman with thistle down hair is clearly a villain, right? He, he's doing bad things. He's, he's basically torturing these people for his own amusement, although he's like not even cognizant of that. Um, but he looks at Stephen, a black man in early 1800s England, and he doesn't understand the concept of racism like he just it it is not something that he can he gets and so he just looks at this guy and he's like you're good looking you seem smart and well like there is what what reason would there be for you to be of a lower class than anyone else and it's like well uh, my skin color um 
and and it's not something that he can get at all and and it's kind of sad because i think steven has internalized this stuff so much right that's that's what like that's what i think is the brilliant thing about this book is there's a lot there's a lot about race it, racism internalized racism and 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 how yeah. society treats this man and how he therefore treats himself that is never like textual because no one is aware of it. It's just there behind the, the text. Yeah. And and it's, it's remarkable because like, I, I remember the point where Steven is, is walking, like he's kind of distracted walking down the street and he bumps into someone and he basically is just like, okay, well this is it. Here's where I die because this gentleman's going to see that a black man just bumped into him right. and he's going to have me killed. And he's just like resigned to it. And it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking because it's not like, it's just like, well, I was always afraid this was going to happen. Um, yeah. and, and so his, his, his relationship with the gentleman is so fascinating because he is like continuously telling him the things about himself that, that are true, that he's good looking and intelligent and, and okay, maybe he should not be the King of England, but he should certainly be a person that it does not have to, you know, for lack of a better word, slave at the, the, the feet of other people. Um, and I, I define that a remarkable contradiction because at the same time he's torturing him and making his life miserable. Right. Yeah. Um, he's it's, it's, it's so in, like you said a minute ago, the, the gentleman with the thistle down here is such a great villain because I don't read him as necessarily being a sadist, especially towards Steven. Like, I think that he just sort of lives in this fantasy world in his own mind where all of his flights of fancy are valid and definitely need to be indulged. Mm -hmm. And like, mm -hmm. that's like, he's so powerful. He's so godlike that, um, that that's just is the way how that, that is the way things are for him. Like yeah. he's, he's so powerful that he can just make, he can just have whatever he wants. And so you, you, you sort of get that, that he would believe that like, oh, you, you're a king. He's like, no, I'm, I'm not a king. I'm a servant. No, you, you're a king, you know, and I'm going to make you a king if you're not a king yet. And then he actually does that, which is funny. Yeah, um, he, he is a king for a minute. Well, then he's a king of, of Fae in the end, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, But yeah. he is the Raven King for... He's, he is the Raven King for a minute, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I like you were saying, the book the book has a lot to say about sexism and racism. Yeah. But it does it in a way where it's 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 still being a Dickensian novel where the the English male protagonists are in the center of this of the stage as right. it were. But all, but all the you know the, the the this this wonderful well drawn black character is also there, and there's wonderful well drawn women characters who are also there, and mm -hmm. they, they get their moments in, in the spotlight as well, of yeah. course. But they um, they never like it, that. That's totally true. Their moments never come like at a point where the book almost becomes anachronistic in its depiction of them. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't have to like break the mold of what Susanna Clark is trying to do here yeah. um, to give these people their, their moment in the spotlight and tell the stories of these, of the, the, the downtrodden people in this society. Um, it feels like a natural extension of what's going on with strange and Norrell. I, I, it's remarkable. Like I, I don't even fully understand how she did it success as successfully as she did. Like this is yeah. definitely a book I could study for a while. And like, like how, how did you pull that off? How did you do it? How did you fit all that subtext in here? Yeah, I agree. Cause like, there's not a, um, there's not a Eowyn pulling off her helmet and saying, I am no man moment where right, it's like, right. it's like, this is the feminism moment of the story or this is the this is the anti-racism moment of the story it's just all it's just always there mm -hmm. subtly woven in through things like the narrative voice or just like the fact that obviously these characters are doing important things in the background that that the you know strange and normal never have any knowledge or awareness of right um, like so i yeah. I, I love that steven is just quietly saving the world throughout the entire book because he's either stopping the gentleman from doing whatever random flight of fancy he wants to do. And then at the very end of the book, he literally saves the world uh -huh. and strange and Norrell are just like, well, we accomplished our objective, yeah. but I don't know what we actually did. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, right. well, that's cause you didn't really do anything yeah. guys. I right. mean, I guess he they technically did. They triggered the spell that, that, that was eventually gave Steven all the power. But I mean, I, I think I think the implication is like the Raven King set the balls in motion and Stephen was the one who actually executed the plan. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, Strange and Norrell served a vital role, but but they they really don't know what they did. They just did what the Raven King wanted them to. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and Tassarowat says class analysis too. There is definitely a lot of class analysis going on there. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, Childer Childer Mass is a great example of that. Um, yeah, yeah, and and they they talk they talk more than a little bit about like in the military how you know I I but like I'm sort of not sort of reaching for details here, but like there was this idea that you can gain rank through military valor. Um, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Michael points out some specific scenes where like lady pole gets to criticize Norrell and, and also strange for their sort of, um, carelessness, uh, w- without anyone, you know, contradicting her. Yeah. Um, and also her and Arabella helping each other is a good kind of example of the, of the sort of, um, commentary that we're talking about yeah yeah definitely definitely i love it i love it so much yeah. and it's not like the the Adv- avenger scene where all the women are in the same shot and it's like yeah girl power right it's just it's just no they're just they're being characters <laughs> yeah, right yeah <laughs> it's not it's not contrived it just is the story mm-hmm. and it's yeah yeah it's great uh okay do you want to move on to the next slide let's do it let's meet jonathan strange Jonathan Strange was a very different sort of person from his father. He was not avaricious, he was not proud, he was not ill-tempered and disagreeable, but though he had no striking vices, his virtues were perhaps almost hard to define. I don't know what that J is doing there. At the pleasure parties of Weymouth and in the drawing rooms of Bath, he was regularly declared to be the most charming man in the world by the fashionable people he met there, but all that they meant by that was that he talked well, danced well, and hunted and gambled as much as a gentleman should. In person, he was rather tall, and his figure was considered good. Some people thought him handsome, but this was not by any means the universal opinion. His face had two faults, a long nose and an ironic expression. It is also true that his hair had a reddish tinge, and as everyone knows, no one with red hair can ever truly be said to be handsome. At the time of his father's death, he was much taken up with the scheme to persuade a certain young lady to marry him. When he arrived home from Shrewsbury on the day of his father's death and the servants told him the news, his first thoughts were to wonder how his suit would affect, would be affected. Was she more likely to say yes now? Or less? This marriage ought to have been the easiest matter in the world to arrange. Their friends all approved the match, and the lady's brother, her only relation, was scarcely less ardent in wishing for it than Jonathan Strange himself. True, Lauren Strange had objected strongly to the lady's poverty, but he had put it out of his power to make any serious difficulty when he froze himself to death. But, though Jonathan Strange had been been the acknowledged suitor of this young lady for some months, the engagement, hourly expected by all their acquaintances, did not follow. It was not that she did not love him, he was quite certain that she did, but sometimes it seemed as if she had fallen in love with him for the sole purpose of quarreling with him. He was quite at a loss to account for it. He believed that he had done everything she wanted in the way of reforming his behavior. His card playing and other sorts of gambling had dwindled away to almost nothing, and he drank very little now, scarcely more than a bottle a day. He had told her that he had no objection to going to church more, if that would please her, as often say as once a week, twice, if she would like it better. But she said that she would leave such matters to his own conscience, that they were not the sort of things that he could be dictated by another person. Um, uh, like, this is one page, and yeah. there's like 17 different things I love uh, in it. Um that's the best thing about this book, is it's, it's actually just, a, it's like 10,000 little awesome short stories, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, like, <laughs> like how many, how many wonderful, like, first of all, the, just like the dig at redheads was just, <laughs> and everyone knows no one with yeah. red hair can ever truly be said to be handsome. Yeah. yeah. And the book kind of like returns to that a few times, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love, I love the whole story about his father freezing himself to death because he's such a hateful, spiteful old man. Yeah. Yeah. It's wonderful. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, <laughs> like, it's just, I love, like, he just is like, she likes me, I think, and I'm doing all the stuff that she tells that I think would make her like me, but she won't marry me. What's up? Yeah. Like, he drank very little, scarcely more than a bottle a day. Uh-huh. A bottle a day. Yeah. And and I like I like when, when he shows up at her house, m- like, relatively much later, and he's, like, and in- he's fully anticipating that she's going to, like, have a list of demands ready for him. And, of course... The, the character we later come to know who's a great person she's like i'm so sorry about your father yeah. he's like he's like taken off guard by this yeah yeah 
<laughs> it's delightful. Um, and I mean, it, it's, I think this is important though, because this is really our first time meeting Jonathan Strange and we meet him as the man who is trying to get this woman to fall in love with him and marry him. Right. That seems to be the thing that he is most occupied with in, in, in the world. And he quickly jumps from this to magic and, Mm-hmm. dives deep into magic like kind of ignoring his wife to the point that she dies thanks to yeah. fairy mischief yeah dies, well, he, he's dies. he's in a it establishes him clearly as like a person who gets obsessed with things but he's also very flighty so he'll be obsessed with this thing laser focused and then switch rapidly to something else mm-hmm. so yeah like you said he's obsessed with her and then he becomes obsessed with magic <laughs> i would i'll go to church more if you want as often as once a week yeah <laughs> Well, so it, it just the, the last sentence to, it just makes me laugh so much where, where it's like, she's like, well, I can't tell you how much to go. It's up to your conscience. And then yeah. I can just imagine him being like, oh, God. So now I have to go like three times a week just to show her that I'm a good person. <laughs> yes. My conscience oh. says I go all the time. Yeah. Right. It's delightful. Yeah. It's really yeah. delightful. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, we like I, I, I guess we can talk about the difference between Jonathan Strange um, and Norrell when they meet each other. Right. Um, sure. And we can talk about the difference yeah. between these two characters, which I think I mean, is the next slide. Yeah, at this point, I would just mention like how many hundreds of pages it is before we actually meet the character who is, in fact, the first name on the cover of the book. Yeah, um, I got my book right here. I mean, the second section is really where it starts. He, he He's introduced like right before we move on to the second volume of the book, which is like mm-hmm. 300 pages into it. Um, so... Yeah. yeah, it's uh, it's pretty nuts. I just thought, it, you know, it's it fascinating because the whole book, you're like, where the hell is Jonathan Strange? Who is Jonathan Strange? Like, right. what? It's just so weird. Well, and um, he keeps being mentioned in footnotes, right? Like, yeah. there's like his like footnotes will say we'll talk about or, or shed light on later events that haven't actually happened in the, the narrative of the story yet. Yeah. It's another great thing about the title is that it's not, you know, Jonathan Strange and Gilbert Norrell. It's mm-hmm. not Mr. Strange and Mr. Norrell. It's. Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. Yes, yes. That it says everything you need to know about him, right? Mm-hmm. It does. Uh, all right, moving on to the next slide where they meet. This is uh, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell argue about the Raven King. Yeah, this is actually them uh, talking about um, their meeting after to the people around them after the fact, after their first meeting. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Mr. Strange, said Mr. Norrell, seems a very pleasant gentleman and a very talented magician who may yet be a most creditable addition to our profession, which has certainly been somewhat depleted of late. Mr. Strange appears to entertain some very odd notions of magic, said Lascelles. He has not troubled to inform himself of the modern ideas on the subject, by which, of course, uh, Mr. Norrell's ideas, uh, which have so astonished the world with their clarity and succinctness. Mr. Drawlight repeated that his opinion that Mr. Strange's red hair had, had no wear in it and that Mrs. Strange's gown, though not exactly fashionable, had not been a, a very pretty muslin. At, at about the time that this conversation was taking place, another set of people, among them Mr. and Mrs. Strange, was sitting down to dinner in a more modest dining parlor in a house in, Char- in Charter House Square. Mr. and Mrs. Strange's friends were naturally anxious to know their opinion of the great Mr. Norrell. He says he hopes that the Raven King will soon be forgot, said Range, said Strange in amazement. What do you make of that? A magician who hopes that the Raven King will soon be forgot. If the Archbishop of Canterbury were discovered to be working secretly to suppress all knowledge of the Trinity, it would make as much sense to me. He is like a, mu- a musician who wishes to conceal the music of Mr. Handel, agreed a lady in a turban, eating artichokes and almonds. Or a fishmonger who hopes to persuade people that the sea does not exist, said a gentleman helping himself to a large piece of mullet in a good wine sauce. Then other people proposed similar examples of folly, and everyone laughed, except Strange, who sat frowning at his dinner. I thought you meant to ask Mr. Norrell to help you, said Arabella. How could I when we seemed to be quarreling from the first moment we met, cried Strange. He does not like me, nor I him. Not like you? No, perhaps he did not like you but he did not so much as look at any other person the whole time we were there. It was as if he would eat you up with his eyes. I dare say that he is lonely. He has studied all these years and never had anybody he could explain himself to. Certainly not to, to those disagreeable men. I forget their names. But now that, you, now that he has seen you and he knows that he could talk to you, well, it would be very odd if he did not invite you again. 
And of course, Arabella is right. Yes, of course. And Arabella is right about everything because the the hilarious contradiction of Strange and Norrell is that they both can't stand each other and also can't imagine not sharing their their, their, their obsession. obsession with each other. Yeah. yeah. And and I love this because like you know, these first three paragraphs up at the very top is is Mr. Norrell doing the gentlemanly thing, which is where he says nothing bad about Mr. Strange at all. Um and the, but he has his his lemmings do the shit talking for him mm-hmm. um, because these people are just like leeches that influence him in the worst ways possible. Both both Lascelles and Drawlight. Um, yeah, and they do it in in such different ways too. Like Cells, he has not troubled to inform himself of the modern ideas on the subject. By which, of course, I mean Mister Norrell's ideas. He does it through constant flattery, and then Drawlight just like digs at their their like uh, physical appearance and. And like, yeah. like it's just it's it's perfect. Like these two people, are, like either just the two people on his shoulders, like whispering, the worm tongues whispering into his ears. Um, he's already like bad with people and bad in public, and he has two of the worst people influencing him and and plotting behind his back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the, I love how they just kind of get worse and worse and worse as the book goes on. And we, we have a slide about that later. But yeah, yeah, yeah. These, these guys suck so bad. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, like this is the, I mean, it, it, the the true disagreement at the core of Strange and Norrell is a, a, a view on history and and a, a view on the future, right? Like like Strange is the type of person that looks very reverently t- to the past of magic, right? He like where they came from, the p- the powers that be in in that past, the historical figures like the Raven King. Where, where Norrell has basically decided that we need to throw all that stuff away and move forward with only this one idea about magic. And it's interesting because, like, normally you'd say, like, obsession with the past versus um, look, look toward the future, and you would say that Norrell would be the more progressive of the two. But that's not true. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I also think, I don't think we have a slide on this, but I, I love the moment when Norrell realizes, like, it was a mistake for me to not explain why I have this position. Like he, it takes so long for him to actually fully explain why, um, why he's so anti Raven King. Right. Right. And like by that time it's sort of too late. Um, but his just his inability to really trust anyone is, is his undoing. Yeah. It, it's really sad. Um, and you grow to understand him as a character, but you're right that it's like the 11th hour reveal. That's just like, Oh, okay, well I get it now, but mm-hmm. still, Thanks, buddy. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, and I, like these two people can't help but like connect to each other. John says, in many ways, Nora represents the enlightenment and strange romanticism. Oh yeah, I yeah. do. I do agree with that. That's a good. That's a really good point. I hadn't yeah. attached those two specifically to them, but yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that's a better. It's a better analogy than the, the industrial revolution. Um, you kind of connect magic to the industrial revolution and in, in the way that it changes warfare and, and like certain specific things. But, but Norrell saying, you know, we need to, we need to, to cut ties with the past and all this, all the superstition and all this and just, um, you know, um, yeah, I think that makes sense. It I should, like it. it should only be intellectual and scholarly, this, uh, casting of spells and dealing with, with, with fairies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's wonderful. Right. Okay. Um, how about the next slide? Yeah. So this, w- we had to do this at some point. We had to pull a footnote because we got to talk about the footnotes. So we, mm-hmm. we pulled one of the footnote short stories so we could talk about the footnotes a little bit. So here's one of them. The story of the master of Nottingham's daughter, to which Mr. Norrell never returned, is worth recounting. And so I set it down here. The fair to which the young woman repaired was held on St. Matthew's Feast in Nottingham, she spent a pleasant day going out about among the booths, making purchases of linings, laces, and spices. Sometime during the afternoon, she happened to turn suddenly to see some Italian tumblers who were behind her, and the edge of her cloak flew out and struck a passing goose. This bad-tempered fowl ran after her, flapping its wings and screaming. In her surprise, she dropped her father's ring, which fell into the goose's open gullet, and the goose, in its surprise, swallowed it. But before the master of Nottingham's daughter could say or do anything, the gooseherd drove the goose on, and both disappeared into the crowd. 
The goose was brought by, bought by a man called John Ford, who took it back to his house in the village of Fiskerton, and the next day his wife, Margaret Ford, killed the goose, plucked it, and drew out its innards. In the stomach she found a heavy silver ring set with a crooked piece of yellow amber. She put it down on a table near three hen's eggs that had been gathered that morning. Immediately the, hen, the eggs began to shake and then to crack open, and from each egg something marvelous appeared. From the first egg came a stringed instrument like a viol, except that it had a little arms and legs, and played sweet music upon itself with a tiny bow. From the next egg emerged a ship of purest ivory with sails of fine white linen and a set of silver oars. And from the last egg hatched a chick with a strange red and gold plumage. The last was only the only wonder to survive beyond the day. After an hour or two the veal cracked like an eggshell and fell to pieces, but, and by sunset the ivory ship had set sail and rowed away through the air. But the bird grew up and, and later started a fire which destroyed most of Grantham. During the conflagration it was observed bathing itself in the flames. From this circumstance it was presumed to be a phoenix." When Margaret Ford realized that the magic ring had somehow fallen into her possession, she was determined to do magic with it. Unfortunately, she was a thoroughly malicious woman, who tyrannized over her gentle husband and spent long hours pondering how to revenge herself upon her enemies. John Ford held the manor of Fiskerton, and in the months that followed he was loaded with lands and riches by greater lords who feared his wife's wicked magic. And of course, the, the story goes on for several more pages from there. <laughs> several, yes. So it's just a great, fantastic little, little perfect short story in the middle of this book. Um, this is this is a perfect example of what I mean, where like this is this is what brings you through the book, actually. Mm -hmm. is like the some people in the chat earlier were saying, like the mystery of the Raven King is what draws you across the book, you know, across the entire book. But as you're going, like, that's not, it's not that enticing of a mystery. It's not like a murder mystery where you're like, I have to know who killed the guy. Like, you don't even necessarily know that you're going to find out what's, what's the deal with the Raven King. Sure. What, 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 what really powered me through the book was these little hits of, like, great little diversions or, you know, little parts of the book that, that kind of make up a perfect little short story on their own with their own little beginning, middle, and end. Um, and the footnotes are a great example of that, obviously. Yeah. I, I'm going to be honest here and say... I do not like footnotes in novels. Um, I don't. I don't like it. I find it distracting most of the time. There are two books that I like footnotes in: this one and House of Leaves, and that's that's it. And that's because specifically the footnotes are designed to almost be a, a, an independent story of its own. I mean, House of Leaves, like half the story is the footnotes, and mm -hmm. this book, like so much of the world building, is these delightful little short stories in the footnotes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I just I, I tend to find them distracting and like uh, when you go off and read a footnote you kind of forget what was happening in the the story proper while you were reading it. Um, but in this book it just doesn't it, like I think the story is so like slow and meandering that that doesn't matter. Yeah. And I, and I do think um, and I do think that uh, Clark like tells the story in such a way where that she recognizes that you're going to go away and read a four page footnote and she kind of eases you back into what was happening sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, with the audiobook, I was never like, get back to the story. I was always just like delighted that there was the footnote basically, mm -hmm. <laughs> which has never happened to me before. I, I kind of agree with you of all the books with footnotes that I've read. I'm usually just like, annoyed you know yeah i always like like okay i gotta go and read the footnote i gotta halt my flow and look down at the bottom of the page and read the smaller font um not here though delightful yeah. every time i saw i turned the page to a, a footnote page i was like ah a footnote a few people in chat calling me out for not having read all these other books with footnotes that are apparently good I so, um sorry about that. I have not read Discworld. Yeah, I did read Infinite Jest. Infinite Jest is f I, I think Infinite Jest gets too much hate, but I also don't think it's like I, I have friends who that's like their favorite book ever, and they are exactly the yeah. type of people you would think they are. I mean, um, anything that people love, people will also hate. Sure, that's true. That's very true. Um. All right. Are we so, done talking about footnotes? Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't, unless you had anything else you want, I think this is probably my favorite footnote. This this delightful story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. Uh but they're all they're all really good. Really good. Yeah. All right. So next we have just a little excerpt from The War in France, a particularly uh, important one, I think. The smoke rolled back, revealing frozen moments like a tableau in a ghostly theater. At the farmhouse called La Haystain, the French were climbing a mountain of their own dead to get over the wall and kill the German defenders. Once Strange was caught outside the square when the French arrived. Suddenly, directly in front of him, was an enormous French cuirassier, 
upon an equally enormous horse. His first thought was to wonder if the, if the fellow knew who he was. He had been told the entire French army hated the English magician with a vivid Latin passion. His second thought was that he had left his pistols inside the infantry square. The cuirassier raised his saber. Without thinking, Strange muttered, Stokes quis animam evocare. Something like a bee flew out of the breast of the cuirassier and settled in the palm of Strange's hand. But it was not a bee. It was a bead of pearly blue light. A second light flew out of the cuirassier's horse. The horse screamed and reared up. The cuirassier stared, puzzled. Strange raised his other hand to smash the horse and horseman out of existence. Then he froze. Can a magician kill with magic? Kill a man with magic, the duke had asked. And he had answered, A magician might, but a gentleman never could. While he was hesitating, a British cavalry officer, a Scots Grey, swung round out of nowhere. He slashed the cuirassier's head open from his chin upwards through his teeth. The man toppled like a tree. The Scots Grey rode on. Strange could never quite remember what happened after this. He believed that he wandered about in a day's confusion. He did not know for how long. So I pulled this particular moment out because, like, this is the mo- one of the more modern modern feeling pieces of the book was the vivid um, uh, uh, visceral violence mm-hmm. and the kind of unflinching depiction of it and the sort of attempts to depict basically people going through such horribly stressful events that it causes them trauma mm-hmm. because yeah. strange is definitely traumatized by this war although the book never actually says that it's very clear yeah no i think you're right yeah that then that is that is a much more modern um not, not interpretation but to to, to focus on Approach. that yeah. yeah 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 and and i i do like that like even in his terror he doesn't kill like he he was so terrified that he was about to use magic to kill this guy and his horse um and he hesitates here because gentlemen do not gentlemen do not use magic to kill and i think like the, there's there's one of the big differences between strange and norrell i think is norrell has this code but it's all kind of bullshit because like his first act was doing something that is against what he preaches to people that like, you should never deal with fairy. Like you should stay away from all that stuff. We, we need to delete all that stuff from existence. And it's, it's obviously a big lie, but I do think strange generally like sticks by his code. Like, I think he means the things he says more than Norrell does. Yeah. I think you're right. Um, I'm trying to decide I'm trying to process the entire book through that lens rapidly. It's it's difficult because there's a thousand pages of it. Yeah, no, I I mean definitely. I mean, Strange is just overall a more likable, honorable, virtuous person. Yes. Um. So not without so, his faults, of course, but not without yeah. his faults. But I think I mean I think the book, it, it such, such as it is, the book has a lot to do with Strange and Norrell both reckoning with their own faults. Mm-hmm. And. Norrell, I, I think more so of the two, like, like, no, uh, wait, what did I just say? No, Norrell is making <laughs> terrible decisions up and toward the end. Uh-huh. Um, uh, whereas strange, I think learns from different mistakes as he goes along and gradually kind of becomes better, um, as he approaches the end. Yeah. I think Daniel raises a good point that Norrell means the things he says when he says them, <laughs> but at the first sign of resistance, will break down on that. I mean, that's basically what happens with the fairy, right? It's like, he sees this as a chance to, um, to, to accomplish his goals. If he can bring this woman back to life, he can accomplish his goals, bring magic back, earn respect for magic, earn respect for himself. And so he breaks, uh, he breaks his, what, one of his most important, uh, tenets and calls upon a fairy because he knows he can't do it himself. Mm hmm. Um, and yeah, evil doom. That's a good, I believes he means what he says. And I think he does. Like, I, I do think like, yeah, he, yeah. I mean, he, he's, a, he is a contradiction of a man. That's certainly true. Yeah. He's, he has too many personality flaws, even though he like, like, it's like, it's, it's like he wants the right things, but he has, he's too weak. I think just calling him weak is probably the best, <laughs> the best phrase. Right. Like, I think that a, a great character moment in this book is when LaSalle's has children mass like slammed against the wall and is literally cutting his face with a knife. And Norrell is just too weak to do the obviously right thing of yeah. kicking out the, the worthless leech that is LaSalle's and keeping the guy who he, he, he already knows children mass is an actual magician at this point. Yeah. 
and and he can't bring himself to stand up for his own serve his, his own loyal servant who's helped him so much and is really you know as people have pointed out responsible for so much of his success yeah um yeah and yeah. uh like that's just yeah even even close to the end of the book he's still he's still weak he still makes bad decisions that's true i, I like what michael says about norrell forgetting which lies he's told to strange and what knowledge he's tried to hide and he just forgets about it because he gets because that's i mean that's the hilarious thing about norrell is he's so excited to share his knowledge with strange but also is remembering that he's trying not to share all his knowledge because he believes in the 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 proprietary nature of all this information and wants to keep it to himself. And yeah, yeah it's like he, he's a walking contradiction and therefore contradicts himself as he's talking. It, it is remarkable. Yeah. And, yeah. and the evil doom says strange being too polite to point it out. They are, they are such a pair, aren't they? Yeah. Right. I mean, I also love like, like Norrell, Norrell has this giant library. He's this, he's like organized and quiet and thought and, and then strange is the kind of person who just like writes notes on like, his hand and then like the arm of his chair and and then like the napkin that he's using, you know, um, and just this like this disorganized kind of absent minded professor type. Mm-hmm. Um, just the fun, the, uh, uh, just, just all the fun little ways in which the characters are contrasted are, are great. Yep. 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 OK, um, we are going to jump way ahead now because this is the long book, but we're going to jump towards the back half of it. Um, and I believe this section right here is when Jonathan Strange has taken some some drops from his madness tincture. Yep. Some madness juice. Yeah. <laughs> to fill the time, he thought he might go and find Mrs. Graysteel. But I suppose her aunt and father will be there. He made a small sound of irritation. Dull, dull, dull. Why do pretty women always have such herds of relatives? He looked at himself in the mirror. Dear God, this neckcloth looks as if it was tied by a plowman. He spent the next next half hour tying and retying the neckcloth until he was satisfied with it. Then he discovered that his fingernails were longer than he liked and not particularly clean. He went to look for a pair of scissors to cut them with. The scissors were on the table and something else besides. What have we here? He asked. Papers. Papers with magic spells on them. This struck him as highly amusing. You know, it's the queerest thing, he told the little wooden figure. But I know the fellow who wrote this. His name is Jonathan Strange. And now that I think about it, I think these books belong to him. He read a little further. Ha! You will never guess what idiocy he is engaged in now. Casting spells to summon fairies. Ha! Ha! He tells himself he is doing it to get himself a fairy servant and further the cause of English magic, but really he is only doing it to terrify Gilbert Norrell. He has come hundreds of miles to the most luxurious city in the world, and all he cares about is what some old man in London thinks. How ridiculous. Uh, so there's a, there's a pretty big part of this book that deals with magic, with uh, with madness, yeah, actually. Yeah, the first time he meets with the king, who has gone mad, um... There's this implication that sort of the, the madmen of London are the magicians. It's almost the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and of course, there's something to this because by intentionally making himself a bit mad, he he is able to be more magical. Basically, it's, it's sort of a sort of a power up for him. Yeah. Um, I I love I absolutely love the scene that comes subsequent to this one where, um, he is able to actually see and talk to the gentleman with the th- thistle down hair um and j- just the complete like like the gentleman being completely baffled and strange like completely misunderstanding everything that the gentleman is doing um it's yeah. just a, it's such a great scene it is a really great scene and i mean i like this too because i think there is what we see here is strange being honest with himself for one of the mm-hmm. very rare times right like like he tells himself he's doing it to get himself a fairy servant and further the cause of English magic, but really he's only doing it to terrify Gilbert Norrell. Um, mm-hmm. how, their, their unending competition is such a big pull of this. And I like that, like, what he doesn't mention here is is one of the, one of the reasons Strange is doing this, one of the reasons Strange is... Um, is, is committed to this is because he lost his wife. And as Michael is saying... Mm-hmm. Um, like he is distraught and depressed and like ruined by the death of the quote unquote death of his wife. And he doesn't know what to do with that. And so he just buries himself in his work. So it is, it is really heartbreaking. Um, mm. Yeah. That he of course can't... he's also engaging in this flirtation with Miss Grace deal. Yeah. Um, but I almost, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm being too kind to him as a person, but 
it almost feels like he's doing that like just because he's supposed to like that is what society like society expects of him to remarry and um and i'm not saying he doesn't like her he does like her but i don't know like i I never felt like his heart was in it really yeah his heart's still kind of broken yeah he didn't seem ready for it and i think it's just evidenced by the fact that he basically bails on that as soon as it becomes clear that he might be able to get his wife back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I, I think, I think madness does play a, a very interesting role in this. And, um, I, I, as you know, it reveal, it is, re- it reveals, right? Like this is yeah. the part you pulled right here. It is revealing something about strange himself that he would not ever consciously admit to himself that like so much of what he does is motivated by trying to both impress and embarrass Norrell. Um, yeah. but it also like, it, it literally reveals that's how he is able to see the fairy through the madness. Mm. Um, it is, a, it is a revealing thing. And yeah. it, so it's a revealing thing, but it's also a distorting thing. I yes. think that's, it, it's fascinating how it works because it's like uh, I almost pulled instead of this. I, I like this part too much, but I almost pu- pulled the part where like he sees pineapples everywhere and he sees pineapples inside people's mouths and yes. everything's pineapples. Um, and, and there's like a few other like like sort of funny stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But it's like it's like, yeah, it gives him it gives him a certain clarity and ability to perceive things others don't. But it also m- makes him sound crazy because he's seeing the pineapples and he's not and he's also lost the awareness that this is a strange thing and that he you know that that this is a sign of madness and that's the problem with it is like when you're mad you don't know you're mad you think you're sane Mm -hmm. and um and so i think like like taking it as a metaphor it's like when you're when you're struggling with you know I, i don't know how far to take the metaphor but you could say like when you're struggling with some kind of mental illness or other maybe in some certain senses you're seeing more clearly, but in other senses you're definitely not seeing more clearly. In fact, you're, you're seeing, you know, either, either actual like hallucinations or you're just seeing everything in a highly twisted, diluted way um, that seems totally real and valid to you. And it's difficult or maybe even literally impossible to extricate like the valuable nuggets of insight that you got from uh from the distorted thinking that was not useful yeah i like that i like that um i hadn't thought about it that way but i agree i mean there is there is you can you can like paste over just this is this is genre fiction creating like reality out of out of metaphor which is that like if you lose someone you love you kind of descend into a hole a little bit Mm -hmm. like like the, the literal column of darkness that he summons around him is very metaphorical right that's mm. like this 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 perfect literal representation of depression that like when when you are near jonathan strange it is always dark there are no stars in the sky there is no light there is no hope there is no joy it is just mm. darkness and despair constantly it's just this perfect creation um and I, I don't know. I, I I love the way in which the book kind of flits back and forth between this this metaphor and the 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 genre fiction allowing to manifest itself in in reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my understanding is that kind of the genesis of the book was this like you know kind of out of the blue story idea that Clark got of a, a magician. Like like I don't know exactly what of this was in the the idea, but like you know a, an English magician in the eighteen hundreds. Um, in in venice um who was way in over his head <laughs> <laughs> and and you know may, maybe like because because it's such a such a powerful like like visually arresting part of the book when he's in this this tower of darkness and it's like a it's i don't know there's something so wonderfully gothic about it yeah it's just this yeah amazing amazing image yeah especially gothic because he's hanging out with lord byron um yeah. i think one of my favorite parts of the book is when he's just like when Clark just puts him at the weekend getaway with Mary Shelley and Lord right. Byron in which she came up with the idea for Frankenstein. Like, so it's like Jonathan Strange was just like there hanging out with him while Mary Shelley is, is conceptualizing Frankenstein. Uh, uh-huh. the, and like, they don't mention, she doesn't mention that. It's just like, it's wonderful. I, I loved it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> and also just d- dragging Byron so so wonderfully. Oh God, so much, so much. Yeah, it's wonderful. It, um, l- like Miss Evildean points out, Byron finds strange to be Byronic, but not quite Byronic enough. <laughs> oh Lord Byron, 
but yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's, there's something interesting here because like throughout a lot of this book, we've been seeing, you know, Norrell as the, Norrell is kind of the conservative, like, don't, we we gotta be careful. We can't mess with too much stuff. We gotta be careful with this stuff. We gotta control it. We gotta, you know, don't deal with the fairies. Don't go too far. Don't practice any of this black magic. And Strange has always been a little bit more of the, 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 more willing to take, to take chances, um, more willing to, to take risks. And I, I do think that while I, tend to be on on the strange side in that paradigm i think a lot of what is happening at this part of the book is like saying that okay maybe norrell had a point about like diving into the stuff too deep mm-hmm. yeah i mean he, he does get in over his head right because mm-hmm. like the, the, at the end of the book he still hasn't broken out of this curse there's no. still in fact norrell is now stuck in this curse with him yeah. <laughs> um the curse of the of, of eternal darkness and, and so forth yeah but they're cool with it because they have each other yeah, they they can just read magic books forever, so it's cool. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, Do you want to move on? Yeah, let's move on. All right. Um, uh, all right. So the next bit. Uh, so this is where I wanted to talk about Lascelles and Draw Light. Let's do it. Because here they kind of both sh- uh, descend to their true natures. What the devil is the matter with you? Do you not understand? Your messages will never be delivered, except for the one to Norrell, and that I shall deliver myself. A howl of anguish burst from Drawlight. Please, please, do not make me fail him. You do not understand. He will kill me, or worse. Lascelles spread his arms and glanced around, as if asking the wood to bear witness how ridiculous this was. Do you honestly believe that I would allow you to destroy Norrell, which is to say destroy me? It is not my fault. It is not my fault. I dare not disobey him. Worm, what will you do between two such men as strange and me? He will be crushed. Drawlight made a sound, like a whimper of fear. He gazed at Lascelles with strange, addled eyes. He seemed about to say something. Then, with surprising speed, he turned and fled through the trees. Lascelles did not trouble to follow him. He simply raised one of the pistols, aimed it, and fired. The bullet struck Drawlight in the thigh, producing, for one instant, a red, wet flowering of blood and flesh in the white and gray woods. Drawlight screamed and fell with a crash into the patch of briars. He tried to crawl away, but his leg was quite useless, and besides, the briars were catching at his clothes. He could not pull free of them. He turned his head to see Lascelles advance upon him. Fear and pain rendered his features entirely unrecognizable. Lascelles fired the second pistol. The left side of Drawlight's head burst open like an egg or an orange. He convulsed several times and was still. Although there was no one there to see, and although his blood was pounding in his ears, in his chest, in his everything, Lascelles would not permit himself to appear in the least disturbed, that he felt would not have been the behavior of a gentleman. God, he's like the biggest scumbag in this book. Lascelles yeah. is like right. totally. Yeah, it, it's he kind of sneaks up on you because like you think like you know Drawlight is an opportunistic con man yeah. the entire time, but and 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 there's really nothing redeeming about Drawlight. Um, but <laughs> like like watching Drawlight kind of descend into, um you know, complete like, uh, poverty and, and, and desperation gives you the satisfaction you were after. And then you're like, all right, well, draw light's been punished. Yeah. Draw light's that's been punished a, that's quite, crimes. that's quite enough for us. Yeah. yeah. That's quite enough. <laughs> then LaSalle's LaSalle's like, he's just this, this snake, this awful snake. And it's only about this point that you realize that he's like just deeply evil. And mm-hmm. like, he, he just basically murders this guy, I, at least like like partially just to keep his position, but partially just because he's like curious to see how it will be. Yeah. It's so I, sick. I, I found the violence here um, very shocking and off putting in a way I, I wasn't expecting. I, I think yeah. this is a book like, you know, we had just had the part where it, it, during the war, like we witnessed someone die. And so it's not like there's not death in this book, but like his his face, like exploding bursting just was like mm-hmm. very like in, in a book this proper and this neat and this tidy and and kind of relaxed this this moment of extreme violence against the character just one-on-one violence like this mm-hmm. was just like holy shit yeah um, it's really it really makes you you know scared of this guy which i think functions beautifully throughout the rest of the story where mm-hmm. let's you know first he he carves up um shoulder mass's face and and then he's he's like 
uh, so, so there's the part where he's sort of trying to bully all the servants and they're not listening to him. And then he gets his wonderful, wonderful justice where he gets trapped into the fairy uh, death curse or, or the, the fairy curse of guarding the tower, which is just yet more like wonderfully screwed up and creepy fairy magic stuff. Yeah, I mean, I try not to um, I try not to feel um, like take pleasure in, in suffering, even the suffering of fake characters. But that felt that felt pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> like when he turns to the new approaching guy and says, I am the guard of this tower. I'm like, ha, yeah. ha. Yeah. Right. That's and and you, you can get. see it coming too because yeah. the previous guard intentionally misses. And yeah. you're like, yeah. oh, this is good. Yeah. It's perfect. Perfect comeuppance. Yeah. Yeah. So those are those characters. Um, yeah. It, I guess the, the only other thing to say about Draw Light is just like, he's, he's actually a really big part of the beginning of the book Mm -hmm. um, where, you know, he's, he's sort of structuring Norrell's entrance into society. And that's, that's a very fun kind of commentary on the way this society works actually, because the the character who is effectively introducing you to British society is a con man Mm -hmm. um, who is manipulating things behind, you know, uh, uh, yeah, just I, I thought that was clever and fun. Yeah, I mean, it, it shows it shows what the society values and what it doesn't. Like, it doesn't matter to them that he's a con man. Like, as long as as long as he looks the part and acts the part, um, and and does favors for people, they're they're totally fine mm-hmm. with it. Um, and it's only until he has that fall from grace that everyone starts calling his debts and his whole his whole uh house of cards crumbles yeah, his, um, his ponzi scheme if you will no, yeah, n- yeah not really that but sort of uh Tringard points out that like you you know how bad draw light is from the beginning mm-hmm. lascelles is always hanging back and being kind of a toady but it's hard to get a sense of how bad he is until this moment and then he's just absolutely awful f- until the end pretty much yeah yeah cool. it, it's great all right um so we'll move on to the next slide here yep. where uh this is me right yeah Yep. Childermass runs into a strange dark man standing over the body of Viniculus. He turned back to make sure that all was right with the body. Someone, a man, was bending over it. He shoved the pistols into the pockets of his greatcoat and began to run, calling out. The man wore black boots and a black traveling coat. He was half stooping, half kneeling in the snowy ground besides Viniculus. For a brief moment, Childermass thought it was strange, but this man was not quite so tall. and and was somewhat slighter in figure. His dark clothes were clearly expensive and looked fashionable, yet his straight dark hair was longer than any fashionable gentleman would have worn it. It gave him something of the look of a Methodist preacher or a romantic poet. I know him, thought Childermass. He is a magician. I know him well. Why can I not think what his name is? Out loud, he said, The body is mine, sir. Leave it be. The man looked up. Yours, John Childermass, he said with a mildly ironic air. I thought it was mine. It was a curious thing, but despite his clothes and his air of cool authority, his speech sounded uncouth, even to Childermass's ears. His accent was northern, of that there was no doubt, but Childermass did not recognize it. It might have been Northumbrian, but it was tinged with something else, the speech of the cold countries that lie over the North Sea, and, which seemed more extraordinarily still, there was more than a hint of French in his pronunciation. (gasps) French! impossible not the french <laughs> not the french fascinating <laughs> of course this mysterious figure then leaves the story and we learn nothing else about him and yeah. it's really kind of a strange addition to this book anyway moving on yeah it's weird like it's this random guy and we never find out who he is or why he's, or anything like that yeah uh, whatever yeah um no so it's 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 cool that we get to see john usclass um yeah even if it's just for a minute and and almost doesn't matter but that's fine it's like he he stoop he swoops in to to save the day at, at, at this one little moment and mm-hmm. then he's gone just completely mysterious perfect perfect it's perfect it is Damn it man. is really perfect I, and i don't think they ever i don't think does Childermass ever like recognize him as the raven king i don't think no, so no, i don't think even i think uh, after he's gone he doesn't remember that he was ever there yeah so. yeah it's clear that there's some some magics going on here yeah, um yeah. which which is funny because it, it means like the raven king could just be like popping in <laughs> all the time everywhere and people just don't remember it um yeah just to be meta for a second it, it is fun that that he is in this book which means that whoever's writing the book somehow 
knows about this event. Yeah, that is that is interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way. But yeah, yeah. in the in the framing device of the book uh, as a history of the 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 rebirth of English magic, um, it basically does declare that that the Raven King was part of was part of this movement. Yeah, maybe Jean as class wrote this book. It could be. It could be. There is a giant raven on the front of it. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, John said that at the same time that I did. Yeah. <laughs> but the delay will make it look like you just stole his idea, it, which I'm assuming yeah. that's what happened. So yeah. way to go, Matt. Way to take we'll someone with, else's idea. We'll go with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so uh, let's let's talk about like the the how the climax of the book a little bit here, because th- basically what happens is um, Usglass uh, like prods and pushes strange and Norrell into casting the spell um which temporarily transfers all of his power to our our, our boy steven who takes all the power and kills um kills our or, friend the gentleman yeah. or at least stops yeah. him or like permanently seals him away or yeah, whatever yeah, yeah i guess I'm he can't not, kill these fairies yeah I'm, I'm not clear on it honestly but yeah. and then yeah and then and then you know the the universe realizes that he's not actually usglass so it it takes the power away but Mm -hmm. then he's because of the rules of how all this works he's able to then take up the kingdom of of the the man with the 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 gentleman with the thistle down here and yeah and and it's great wasn't it was called no hope right um Uh, lost hope. lost hope but that that was just because of the the gentleman um he turns it into a beautiful place and Mm -hmm. um lives happily ever after yeah well one of my favorite parts of this book i mean i just have to talk about it sure go for it it just struck me like one of my favorite parts was just like 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 what the first the first bit where Stephen is just becoming aware of kind of the enchantedness where like all the servants are kind of extremely on edge because they like look out windows and see thick forests outside the house even mm-hmm. though there aren't forests or look in the mirror and see you know candelabras and and people that aren't there and and hear th- hear hear music that isn't there and like kind of the the creepy like 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 really like kind of uh you know sends send chills down your spine kind of creepiness of the way the 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 enchantment the the encroachment of of lost hope into the real world um i just thought that was some of the most uh beautiful and and evocative stuff in the whole book yeah i i really liked the moments where like Steven just like keeps getting stuff. I, I think that the moment where like you go into his tiny room and he has like more treasures in that room than any any like the Library of Alexandria uh-huh. or like the the British Museum. Like it's just like he has un- uh, countless artifacts of uh-huh. incredible value just stuffed in his little servant quarters because the gentleman with thistle down hair just keeps giving him stuff. Yeah. And there's nothing you can do with it, and no one else will like notice that he has them or think anything weird about it. Yeah, because they're all enchanted. Yeah, I, and I mean, I, I love it because it starts so simply with the extra money given to uh, the baker that he uh, has is having a, a relationship with, or well, not actually having yeah, a relationship, a one sided relationship. Yeah. yeah. It it is so fascinating to me how the gentleman is aware enough to acknowledge that like if I give him these riches and stuff he will be happier, but completely unaware of the misery that going to lost hope every night is causing in his life. It's so, it's so fascinating how like his, his perspective is so framed on everything he does and every, every place that he exists is the best possible place in the world that he literally, like, I, I really don't think the gentleman is like maliciously trapping, um, lady pole, uh, yeah. Mrs. Strange or Steven. I just think he's, I think someone earlier in chat said he's like a three year old with unlimited power. He just yeah. doesn't, he doesn't fully comprehend why this would be hurting these people. Yeah. He just sees what he wants to see. And mm-hmm. he, he assumes that they're going to have a great time at his party because it's a party. So why wouldn't you have a great time? Sure. Sure. And he's really our only example of, of fairy in this story, right? Um, I guess. I mean, some of the other people at the party might be fairies, but we don't really get to see much from them. So. Yeah. Lost hope is the cornfield. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, do we want to uh, finish this book? <laughs> I understood that reference. <laughs> um, yeah, let's finish this book. It is more than a little odd, continued Mr. Norrell in a tone of wonder. We have done everything we set out to do, and... But how we did it, I do not pretend to understand. 
I can only suppose that John Usglass simply saw what was amiss and stretched out his hand and put it right. Unfortunately, his obligingness did not extend to freeing us from the darkness. That remains. Mr. Norrell paused. Then, th this then was his destiny, a destiny full of fear, horror, and desolation. He sat patiently for a few moments in expectation of falling prey to some or all these terrible emotions, but was forced to conclude that he felt none of them. Indeed, what seemed remarkable to him now were the long years he had spent in London, away from his library, at the beck and call of the ministers and the admirals. He wondered how he had borne it. I am glad I, I did not recognize the raven's eye for what it was, he said cheerfully, or I believe I would have been a good deal frightened. Indeed, sir, said Strange hoarsely. You were fortunate there, and I believe I am cured of wanting to be looked at. Henceforth, John Usglass is welcome to ignore me for as long as he pleases. Oh, indeed, agreed Mr. Norrell. You know, Mr. Strange, you really should try to rid yourself of the habit of wishing for things. It's a dangerous thing for a magician. He began a long and not particularly interesting story about a 14th century magician in Lancashire who had made, who had often made idle wishes and had caused no end of inconvenience to the village where he lived, accidentally turning the cows into clouds and the cooking pots into ships and causing the villagers to speak in colors rather than words and other such signs of magical chaos. At first, Strange barely answered him, and such replies as he made were random and illogical, but gradually he appeared to listen with more attention, and he spoke in his usual manner. Mr. Norrell had many talents, but penetration into the hearts of men and women was not one of them. Strange did not speak of the restoration of his wife, so Mr. Norrell imagined that it could not have affected him very deeply. <laughs> <laughs> I love these guys! I love these guys! Oh my I, I god! Love the way I love the way that's written too, because you're you're like it's just like oh, so Strange is having a is having a breakdown right now yeah. because his wife is alive mm -hmm. and Norrell's telling him a boring story. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, but Strange uh, can't help but eventually get sucked into the boring story because as much as he can't stand Norrell's you know boring stories and chiding, he can't help but be fascinated and talk about magic either. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I I I love Norrell's like like processing of what is happening like. Okay, I'm stuck in this darkness forever now. A destiny full of fear, horror, and desolation. And then he's like, oh, I don't actually care because, like, yeah. my books are here and yeah. everything else is just a waste of time. So I'm just going to read and study. Like, like th This is why it's a great character arc for him, actually, because... Mm -hmm. Like London was terrible for him. Yeah, like, he never should have gone to London. He, no. it, his nature as a person, he's not a people person. He didn't like it. He didn't enjoy it. He actually just wanted to be alone with his books the whole time. Yep. Yep. And yeah, it's it's great. Um. So I guess on, on the strange side, like there is there is another chapter after this where Strange gets to talk to his wife very briefly, right? And you know, it, it's not like a happy ending for him, but he seems like at peace with himself and is like he's happy he helped his wife. Um, and he's he's going to continue to work on a way to get out of this this yeah. column of darkness. But he's mostly just enjoying he's <laughs> enjoying his time with Norrell for now. Yeah, I thought it was a great a great uh, 19th century ending mm -hmm. because it's not ha happily ever after. It's you're still trapped in a gothic column of eternal darkness, but maybe someday you'll get out and be re reunited with your true love. Yeah. And so it's like, uh, uh, you know, hopeful and, and a beautiful image. And I'm very happy with the conclusion, honestly. I am too. I am too. And and these two characters get to be together, which maybe is the thing that they both wanted more than anything. Yeah, yeah. All of this mends their terrible rift. So mm -hmm. yeah. And they can't actually leave each other at all. No, they're they're stuck together. Uh huh. Because yep. if the, if one of them goes too far away, he pops back. Yep. 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 What a wonderful enchantment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that shows the fun like the, the the enchantment itself shows the 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 peculiarities of magic itself right because like the reason this happened is because the the gentleman with the thistle down hair didn't like specify which magician he meant so it like mm -hmm. just said ah yes yeah. the they're both the English magician yes yeah, so it yeah. must be both of them right. um, it's delightful yeah and and there's there's a whole like there's there's a great a great kind of ending denouement to this to this whole book where you know the the uh, Children Mass and, and Vinculus and, and others get, kind of go to the Society of English Magicians and are like, 
we're the society now yeah you know? welcome it's, and yeah. of course it immediately degrades into sex like the the strangeites yeah. and the the the, the norlites um yeah. as of course it would um even it, it's so funny because like they remove themselves from the world like strange and Norl are according to the book barely seen again if ever um uh-huh. not involved in the goings-on of, of english magic anymore doing their own thing and yet like people people pick up their torches and carry them forward without them and that's just so that's just just so human yeah yeah i love i love the way magic felt in this book i think we're kind of wrapping up so i'm just going to editorialize i, I just sure. love the way magic felt and just the 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 beautiful hints of like oh yeah there's 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 many many worlds out there and what does that mean i don't know use your imagination that's yeah. the, that's the most fun thing about it is so much of it is left to your imagination yeah i mean i think hard magic systems have their purpose but in a story like this the magic being as soft as possible um just it just breeds the creativity of the world it's yeah, yeah I, I like it too like what is the extent of this this ha, what makes a magician more powerful than another we we don't know why yeah. why could these two magicians cast spells when no one else seemed to be able to was it just because they for for lack of trying or were they gifted with some sort of power none of that is explained and it doesn't need to be yeah it's it's almost like it's it i mean you could i think that's what's fun is is it leaves it open for you to make your own guesses like okay well they're both sort of eccentrics in their own way and yeah. and and maybe all it really did take was suitably ex- like like a suitable degree of es- es- eccentricity and some degree of knowledge about how magic is supposed to go um mm-hmm. and and also like like i said earlier like it, it's it, it was pretty clear to me that like whenever um whenever children mass does his tarot readings he's doing magic yeah it's just not the it's not it's not by the book magic right he he doesn't he, he never read the textbooks about it so he doesn't know how to do the spells but he he is doing magic, so so you can almost say this whole narrative that Norrell and Strange brought magic back into England is actually sort of a a, a ridiculous piece of of you know upper class propaganda because maybe <laughs> magic was was existing in kind of a low key fashion the whole time if people like Children Mask could do it. Yeah, I like that. Like that, there's just this this entire underclass of magicians that are just not being paid attention to at all because they are not they are not gentleman magicians. Yeah. Um I don't know if there's any textual support for that. I guess, I guess Children Mass might be. And 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 I don't know cuz like it the book is really clear that like after after Strange and Norrell do their thing, suddenly people suddenly magic is just falling out of the woodwork. There's yeah, people yeah. the 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 boy is able to cure the girls the girl who fell through a plate glass window or whatever. And it's like, yeah, all these, all these clearly supernatural things start happening. So yeah, so th- they do, they do change something meaningfully. That's yeah. true. John is saying though, that the prophecy can match, uh, vinculus and children mass just as well as it matches strange and Norrell. So, mm-hmm. um, it would not surprise me that the gentlemen are the ones that get the credit, even though it was the, the lower class ones that, that did the work. That's perfect. I love mm-hmm. that. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. I, I didn't get that. Um, yeah, I did notice the prophecy was one of those wonderful vague fantasies. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess my my complaint with the prophecy is that this book's so long and drawn out that like by the time it started mattering, I kind of didn't remember it all. Um, <laughs> fair, fair. Um, so I think it was also just my method of reading this book. Like if I had actually like just like copied the prophecy out and just had it like on my desk as I was reading, I might have been able to draw those connections a little bit better. Well, the book is also fairly cagey with what the prophecy actually says if i recall yeah um but <laughs> yeah yeah i guess i could have just done that too john i could have just done that just, just read it a bunch of times yeah <laughs> yeah uh Tringard's right that that well, the, the main downside of audiobooks i agree with you Tring, Tringard, is when i'm like oh i want to go back and read that one part and then i'm like oh it's an audiobook i literally I, it would be so hard for me to actually go back to any particular point um mm-hmm. but what a oh wonderful well. what a wonderful book anything else y'all uh, have to say questions or uh just things that you wanted to that we didn't cover that you wanted us to um it's just just a delightful book while we're waiting for that to come in why don't we go ahead and talk about next month or uh as as i'll say uh later later this month yeah later in in a <laughs> three, couple of three weeks, weeks three yeah, fridays right. from or, yeah. well two fridays from today two friday yeah. oh my god Wait, hold on. Is that no, true? No, no, no. Three Fridays. Two, three, three Fridays, Fridays yeah. yes. Thank you. Thank God. <laughs> uh, although I am almost finished with this book, so. 
Um, shall we announce it? Shall Shall I announce it? Scott? Yeah, go for it. Um, yes. So this is every six months. Um, Scott or I will just pick the book that we're going to do because that's the privilege that you get. By <laughs> the book and so I am picking The Likeness by Tana French because it's been too long since I read Tana French. I've been wanting to read this book for like 10 years or something ridiculous. Yeah. I'm finally emotionally ready for it after my long recovery from reading In the Woods. Mm-hmm. And then we which, read The Secret Place for Book Club years and ago. And then we read The Secret Place for Book Club, which was great. One of my favorite books on, on the book club, perhaps. Mm-hmm. One, one of my favorite discussions. So we're reading The Likeness, and I am, I, I've already uh, read most of it, honestly. Um, but uh, it's great, and everyone should read it, and everyone should read Tana French. And uh, can't wait to talk about it next, next uh, at the end of the month. Yeah, I don't know if we ever talked about this, but after we did the Secret Place book club, um, I spent the next three months reading everything Tana French has ever written. Um, and it was a most enjoyable time. And she came out with a new book last year, the year before. And she actually just came out with a new book just this month, uh, just on this Tuesday. Her newest novel came out. And so I'm, I'm going to go get that tomorrow. And I'm going to try to fit that in before I start to read this thing. Um, I, I love Tana French. And, and I would really, if you did not read The Secret Place with us, um, I really suggest you guys give this a try. She, the way she writes is just wonderful just absolutely wonderful so yeah that's uh it'll be friday october 30th the last friday of the month three fridays from now um it's not that long of a book certainly not like this one so hopefully y'all are able to finish it and we did we did announce it early but i know some people don't check the website and they just rely on this book club so we're sorry that we were a couple weeks late on this but uh, hopefully y'all have enough time to to finish that book um so in the chat uh folks are talking about the tv show there is a uh, BBC miniseries, I believe, based on Strange and Oral, and I have not watched it, but I I've want, I want to. I want to. I saw the, 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 the portrayal of the man with the thistle down hair is so not what I was imagining that I can't watch the show. I'm sorry. Is he on one of your rotating pictures? No, he's not. Okay. I didn't put him on there because I don't agree with that portrayal. I I'm gonna don't think I'm gonna be correct. honest with you. I love the name, the man with a thistle down hair. I don't know what thistle down is, and so I have no way of mentally imagining that. Yeah. What, what um, is that? What is I? I don't know. It's it's like um, if you just Google a picture of it, it'll pop up immediately. But basically, it's like. You know, different how different plants have like um like like dandelion, you know, mm-hmm. um different plants have like that sort of thing where the seeds are attached to little little extremely thin, white, pale, uh, downy material. Sure. Um. Yeah. So it's th- there's some plants like if you look up thistle down, you'll see it's like a, it's like a big poof of of white, um, very very thin thistles, sort of like a dandelion, but but that's not quite right. Um, that doesn't seem like good hair. Uh, well, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's definitely kind of fey, right? It's mm-hmm. kind of, uh, it's it's kind of inhuman. It's um, you know, s- silvery blonde and very kind of like supernaturally poofy and and inhuman. Um, oh, now I'm looking at him in the in the the miniseries. Interesting. Yeah. He does yeah. look. I don't know. I think he looks suitably fey and creepy. For, I, I'm 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 sort of exaggerating my complaint but i i actually just imagined him being a lot younger um and more more kind of like uh impish so um you know, more more like a. oh uh, someone know. did a, a drawing of <laughs> it's so creepy uh that's that's creepy there's a lot of creepy drawings of what he looks like i don't know that's too creepy that one i didn't i didn't see him as like being like he's i don't know I, I saw him as being very handsome and young because yeah. he because he he's described as being handsome. And this guy is like super old and yeah, this is wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> um. Okay. Anything else? Anything else? No, I think I am happy with that conversation, and I am excited to talk about the next book in a few weeks. Oh, there's a oh, there's a there's a version. Someone did a, a Willem Dafoe version of the man with the thistle down hair. No, that's too creepy. Yeah, no, he's not supposed. He's supposed to be beautiful. Like that's the point. He's mm-hmm. he's beautiful. That makes him scarier. I don't want him to look like Willem Dafoe. Sorry, Willem Dafoe, if you're listening. <laughs> Go, he looks. This version looks like Green Goblin, but. 
thistle down hair. Yeah, that's it's not right. I have to do my own <laughs> fanfic now or fan art now. Yeah, go oh. for it, Matt. Go for okay. it, Matt. Okay. okay, yeah. Um, anything else, folks? If not, I think we're gonna gonna wrap this up here once again uh thank you for being patient with us as we had to reschedule and everything we really appreciate that we don't we don't like rescheduling especially stuff like this um because we announce the date so much in advance and we know some people plan around it so we hate when we have to do that but uh matt was definitely not in a, in a place where he could do it um so yeah it would have just been bad for his eye and yeah 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 sorry about that i mean illness is a is a thing that happens mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. um i will i will never let it happen again yeah never let your eye don't get pink eye anymore matt okay it wasn't pink eye it was <laughs> some, some other weird thing but yes yeah all right folks Thank you so much. Uh, those of you that tuned in live, we really do appreciate it. Uh, if those of you that are listening to the audio on the podcast after the fact, uh, for many reasons, maybe because you just didn't have this night free because we had to reschedule so last minute, um, hopefully join us next month. Join us to talk about The Likeness. The Likeness, Tana French, I think those are books that, in my opinion, are always really fun to talk about because the, the prose is, is beautiful, much like this book. Um, it's doing a lot of things. It's just it's fun to read and it's fun to talk about. Um, we hope that we see you next week, month, well, yeah. weeks, next three weeks, whatever. That's right. If you like what we do here at Doof Media and you want to see more of it, head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia and consider donating a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford. You'll get access to the Discord server as well as the ability to vote for which books that we cover on this uh, book club as well as tons of other cool benefits. So go check that out. Yeah, um, we maybe didn't open the vote this month, but it will open again next month. So there will be a poll coming out in a, in a few weeks for uh, what month? November? Jesus, November. Um, so get ready to vote for November. And and if you have any books that you want us to put on that poll, make sure there is a um, there is a, a Google spreadsheet on the website. It's if you go to the book club section of the website, there'll be a link right there. Or if you're on the Discord, it'll be pinned um, to submit books for our consideration. And so we'll we draw from those books and we're building our list of five. So. Make sure you do that if you have anything else that you want us to read. Um, but that's it for us. Um, if you have any questions or comments or just want to reach out to us, you can find us on Twitter at Doof Media, or you can send us an email at doofmedia at gmail.com. We will see you all in a few weeks. And we're out. Let me click uh, stop recording on this thing. Boom. Matt Oost Glass. That's very, that's very presumptuous of you, Matt. Matt named himself Matt Usglass on our recording program. It, it does seem that, that I'm playing with fire there, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, man. You're just going to draw his attention to you. Oh. Don't want to uh, draw his eye. No. No. All right, folks. Um, I'm pretty tired. <laughs> yeah. So I think and, we're just going to, we probably won't, aren't going to hang out for a little bit. Um, we're just going to call it. Uh, thanks yep. for hanging out, everyone. It was a lot yeah, of fun. Yeah, this is great. Thanks. Yeah. I, I really valuable contributions this week. So. I, I missed I missed this, you know, when we had to delay it. Like it's part of my 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 monthly routine and I missed it. So thank you everyone for participating. That was a yeah. lot of fun. Good night, everybody. Good night. Catch y'all later. <laughs>